This week on Crossfeed. Irish blasphemy. A rapist and a Christian. Tiger Woods and Brit Hume. End of the world date determined. And can Christian churches celebrate Monza? Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Welcome, everybody. Hey, everybody. Uh, Where right now we are having the hottest political race I ever remember in Mass being in, in, in my close to 20 years in Massachusetts. Really? Why is that? Yeah. Uh, we have a special election for uh, the seat that Ted Kennedy was was uh, in last week, and uh, we uh, I was in until he passed away last year. And, of course, everybody assumed that the uh, Democrat was going to walk away with it. Matter of fact, a month ago, she was 30 points ahead. As uh, Right now, they're saying it's too close to call. She's Most polls have her one to two points ahead. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty amazing for a rather blue state. For what's considered the bluest state. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, the other day, uh, yeah, on Tuesday, uh, uh, uh the, the Republican did a, um, uh, internet fun, uh, money raiser, fundraiser and raised 1.3 million in one day. Wow. His goal was 500,000. Huh. So it's 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 been a very interesting thing, you know. I used to wonder, you know, because we, I mean, nobody ever advertised up here because you know it was no no need. So I, I, you know, I was in some of these battleground states and seeing these ads constantly, especially in the negative ones. And how do you mm-hmm. stand it? And that's what we're facing with now. I was in the gym <laughs> today, and you know, the gym has like ten screens, you know, at different channels. I mean, ad would be off one screen and on another. It was just it's just constant. Hey, welcome to my world, man. I go from from Iowa, the uh, you know first in the nation, to Ohio, which is like the determining state, you know the uh, the purplest state. <laughs> so okay, yeah, but that's it's all new for us up here in Massachusetts. So it's not saying nothing we're doing. Of course, it, would, it might be really different if this was Ireland. You know, we we have a lot of Irish up here. There you go. So, um, so uh, there's a group called Atheist Ireland, and it took me a long time to realize that's the name of a group. I was kept reading this, you know, and kept going, "Why doesn't say Irish atheists?" Okay, yeah. finally, that, 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 that it's Atheist Ireland, and um, so uh, um, Ireland apparently has just passed a law. Um, which forbids anything that is blasphemous, yep. uh, grossly abusive or insulting in relation to matters held sacred by any religion, thereby causing outrage among a substantial number of adherents of that religion. And so, uh, But it's okay if they had literary, artistic, political, scientific, or academic merit. Okay, so... Um, they've published a book that has 25 quotes. That's, that's, that's a short book, dude. <laughs> and uh, That's a one-page pamphlet. Yeah. <laughs> but they're calling it a book. And uh, it's according to CNN. And it has quotes from Jesus, Muhammad, Mark Twain, Salman Rushdie, and Bjork. <laughs> Who's Bjork? Um... Isn't that a singer? I don't know. I think so. I think that's Maybe that. So. Is that the woman in the picture? Yeah, I think so, it is. It's so, not real cute either. <laughs> it's a, kind of a lousy picture, too. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> you can see the fillings in her teeth. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, what is that? The, like the third molar there is obviously great. <laughs> There's definitely a filling there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a $35,800 fine. On blasphemers. Yeah, and you know the thing is, I'm, I'm looking at the way this is worded and stuff, and I'm thinking, 
you know, where do you draw the line? I, th- I think I'm siding with the atheists on this one. Um, because, you know, you look at, they said they've got quotes from Jesus. Now, I don't know what the quote is, but I can guess that it's something like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but by me. Right. I, I don't know what it is either. I'd like to know what that what they are. But no, I mean, this the way it's wording, uh, abusive or insult, grossly abusive or insulting your relation to matters held sacred by any religion, thereby causing outrage among a substantial number of the adherents of that religion. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, th- th- this this reminds me of the, the, the speech codes on college campuses, where it's not what, you know, it's it's not what I, it's what I say, but it's more, are you offended by what I say? Right. You know, it, you know, and, and, and even if I, you know, and then how do I prove it's okay if it's mildly abusive, just not grossly abusive. Yeah. Wow. I wouldn't want to be a judge having to deal with this stuff. Right. Where do you draw do that you, line? Well, and how do you determine if it has literary, artistic, political, scientific, or academic merit? <laughs> to some people, you know, that's like, <laughs> okay, let's just take, for example, the whole creation debate. All right. Now, uh, a, a Darwinist scientist is um is going to say that that any creation um uh document even if it's a a, a scientific write up uh, written by a phd and um and they say you know they look at this and they would say well it doesn't have any literary artistic political scientific or academic merit um even though you know it it was written for that purpose but if they say well no it doesn't have any merit it's it's not worth anything then, well, too bad, you know, it all depends on what the judge thinks. Right. It's, 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 it's way too subjective. Okay, on the other hand, the, the, the atheists said they want to get every reference to God out of the Irish Constitution and stuff like that. Okay, you've just gone too far, guys. But, you know, I would agree, I, you know, uh, um, um, because I, I, I am a bit of a free speech absolutist. And uh, sure, some people might say things that are offensive to me, but we do not have a right not to be offended. Yep. yep <laughs> I mean, that's, that's right. just the reality. Yeah, here's um, the, um, they say, we unreservedly support the right of any Irish citizen to make comparable statements about matters held sacred by any religion without fear of being criminalized and without having to prove to a court that a reasonable person would find any particular value in the statement. Right? Because the reality is, if I find value in the statement, then that should be good enough. I should be allowed to say whatever I want, you know, so long as I'm not, you know, there's all those sort of exceptions. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater and, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, that's just sort of common sense stuff. But as far as, as being offensive, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> you, I, you get into the whole sort of um, profanity, you know, and, and how do you define that? And, you know, there's definitely, like, I see stuff on bumper stickers that I never would have seen years ago that I don't want my kids seeing. But at the same time, I know that it's stuff that they hear at school. <laughs> so you just teach them that, well, you know, that's not right. And, but yeah, you know, to say, well, if this is going to offend somebody, we got to get rid of it. Well, then you might as well just slap a piece of duct tape over everybody's mouth. Cause no matter what they say, you know, I'm sure we've offended some people in Ireland just in the few minutes that we've been doing this podcast already. <laughs> if we That's haven't just hang on. Cause we will. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we could offend a rapist. Just by the fact we're Christian. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> now, when I saw that this was from the Sun, I figured you were just interested in because you like page three. So I didn't. I just saw the article. I oh. don't even know what you're talking about. You, you've never heard of the, the Sun's famous page three, where they show all these. Nearly nude, topless women. Uh, nope. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very uh, 
Jim yeah, knows so more rather, about that kind of thing than I do. <laughs> well, I just uh, 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 yeah, up here there's a thing called page six, but yeah. So uh, anyway, so anyway, so I I just yeah. Well, if you actually look on the side there, down below it says page three wallpaper girls A to Z, page three TV. So you know it's it's something I did you know. Anyway, um, that's what you get for growing up in a family of six brothers. Anyhow, so, uh, 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 but yeah, this atheist rapist. His uh, name is Stephen Ralph. Yeah, well, and it's he's, Barman, he's, yeah, Stephen Ralph, who's a barman, yeah. uh, complained that his human rights were breached by having to share a prison cell with a, quote, Christian lag, unquote. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, that's. I I'm not familiar with that expression. That's that's got to be a specifically British uh, expression. I'm sure it was. Um, but uh, this is a guy who was jailed indefinitely after admitting raping two women that he targeted when he served them drinks in a pub, and uh, he's branded a sexual predator by the police. They said he could have had as many as forty victims. Right. And uh, he wrote to uh, an inmate's magazine and said uh, that he had the displeasure of sharing a cell with a Bible-thumping believer. And he was furious at having to share his prison with a Christian convict and wanted him to be evicted. Uh, uh, The Christian guy wound up being removed. You're in jail, buddy. (laughs) You know... Forty women had the displeasure of your company, and <laughs> That's right. you didn't have a problem with that. And they were doing a whole lot more than talking to you about Jesus, or or you were to them. So, um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm not real sympathetic here, and and it's not because it was a Christian. It could have been a Muslim, or it could have been a, you know, it could have been somebody who was hearing voices for that matter. Um, you know, this is just. Oh, I, I got stuck with somebody who was talking to me about love, and I'm not interested in love. <laughs> you know? I don't know. You're in prison, buddy. You know, you don't have too much you can say. I I, I feel bad for the Christian guy having to put up with him. Uh-huh. Something tells me he was no 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 pleasure to, to, to deal with. Yeah, I, you know, you think of it this way, he could have ended up with another rapist. Personally, I think that would be worse. Yeah, it could be. I don't know, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, so. short story, but it was just kind of it was just kind of goofy that if you know he's all worried about his rights when he didn't care about the rights of anybody else, you know. Uh, and and really, come on, this is you know sometimes Christians in America talk about being persecuted for their faith, and I, I saw a quote. Uh, it was today or yesterday. It said. No Christian in the United States is ever persecuted. Um, you know, maybe belittled or, you know, or ridiculed or, um, or, or something like that, but persecuted, no. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of the same thing here. You know, he's, he's not being persecuted. He's not, he's just, oh, he has to deal with somebody that he doesn't like. <laughs> Welcome to prison. Right. There's not a whole lot of likable people there. That's why they're in prison. If you don't want to get locked up with a Christian, <laughs> then, you know, don't rape 40 women or, or any for that. Or don't watch Fox News and listen to Bert Hume. <laughs> Which brings us to our buddy Tiger Woods. Now, a couple weeks ago, um, on uh, um, they, they were having this period on, um, I think it was Fox News Sunday, and they talking about what advice would you give Tiger Woods, and they all kind of went around. And uh, which is now, uh, and one of the people, of course, on there is, is Britt Hume, um, who uh, told uh, them that, uh, you know, what Tiger Woods really needs to do is repent and turn to the Christian faith and find forgiveness there. And just a lot of people are just very upset about this. Because uh, this was a very politically incorrect thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, okay. So the, the argument is that um, 
that he this is a news show it's not for proselytizing and and yada 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 okay but here's the thing right we're talking specifically about giving advice you know uh and if you know and i've heard the the discussion okay what if it was oprah and she suggested some sort of um you know new age strategy or or whatever you know like or or for that matter since tiger woods is buddhist you know some sort of a a buddhist um uh, you know i don't know uh, meditation exercise or, or something like that um you know would that uh would that be okay you know what's the i i don't know i i just don't get what the big deal is and this is um this particular article that we're looking at, and this is all over the place, but this one's from NPR's news blog, The Two Way, and um, they had they did a um, a poll to get. Now this is NPR's listeners, so they swing a little bit to the left uh, overall. Um, and uh, it was was Hume wrong to say what he did? Forty nine percent yes, fifty one percent no. So, you know, it's pretty much right down the middle. I, I don't think that that 1% is even statistically significant there. And uh, so, you know, but overall it, it seems like we're, people are pretty divided on it. But, um, you know, I would, I would say if, if anything, the majority says nah, there's nothing wrong with what he did. So, I, I don't know, for me this seems like it, it kind of goes back to that, now this isn't law, this is more sort of journalistic uh, kind of unwritten rules or or whatever, or I don't know, maybe there's written rules, I don't have a journalism degree. Um, but uh, he was, you know, the Tiger Woods is dealing with guilt. Well, there's only one religion in the world, um, or or one anything in the world, that can really help you with guilt. And that's Christianity. Right. This was an opinion section of the show. It wasn't tech, was, wasn't considered to be news. Uh, and it was, you know, <clears throat> an opinion part. And, and Brigham has changed. I mean, uh, he said, uh, I can't remember how many years ago he that he became very active. He said up to this, he was a nominal Christian, you know, kind of like Christian Easter a couple times a year. And he had a son who was 28 years old and uh, committed suicide. And that really kind of just slapped him in the face and just really turned him around and said, you know, what's there for me now? What's going to get me through this pain? And that's where he found uh, that uh, God really made the difference in his life. And that's where he turned himself to Christianity and to about it. If you want to read a little bit more about this, uh, you can go to the Christianity Today website. And they have actually had an interview with Brit Hume and asked him about his faith and stuff. And uh, kind of interesting in his church membership, uh, he's, he doesn't really go on Sundays. Uh, he's not real active. Uh, he has this little house church that he goes to during the middle of the week. Hmm. Uh, okay. So that's kind of different. But uh, but uh, uh, really shares, and it's really interesting. Uh, I, I've always had a lot of respect for Brit Hume. Uh, I remember back when he was with Peter Jennings and we covered the, the White House. And uh, so I always uh, liked him a lot. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think people are getting their underwears in a bundle for nothing. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe, maybe you know, maybe Tiger needs to, you know, give up the Buddhism and turn to, you know, start celebrating Kwanzaa. There you go. Yeah, which is kind of a tricky thing for him because he's he doesn't even consider himself African American. No, um, he. He's, but uh, we've got a, a church up in Connecticut in Norwich, Evans AME Baptist Church. And uh, they had a Kwanzaa uh, celebration. And this kind of this just kind of struck me because you always hear around Christmas time, you hear Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, once in a while um, Ramadan gets mentioned, uh, you know, and, and this sort of... Um, all these sort of competing holidays. And, and I saw this and I thought, huh, that's interesting. And, um, you know, Kwanzaa not really being something that's specifically uh, for me because I am, you know, very Western European. I'm German and English, so um, not really my thing. 
Uh, so it, I, it got me thinking, and, and I decided, well, let's, you know, let's really take a look at Kwanzaa and see what it's all about. And so I went to, I mean, it's the only holiday that has an official website <laughs> um, by its founder. And Kwanzaa's not a religious uh, holiday. It's oh. purely cultural. And mm-hmm. it starts on the, the 26th of um, of December. So, uh, you know, if you want to, it, it says right on the site, that, I mean, because there's rules. <laughs> there's even stuff about, you know, not practicing it properly and, and stuff like that. But um, they, they say that... Um, you know, it's it's not a religious holiday, so that anybody from you know from any religion can um, and can celebrate Kwanzaa. Uh, it is specifically for people of African descent, um, and it really sort of it. You know, there was there's a fact there, and it talks about um, you know, well, I'm not of African descent. Can I celebrate Kwanzaa? And it kind of it sort of well, these principles are for everyone or whatever, but. It really sort of seems to stress that this is particularly for people of African descent, um, which kind of struck me because I, I've got real mixed feelings about that kind of thing, um, about sort of emphasizing. I understand, you know, embracing your culture and your ancestry and, and stuff like that. Um, at the same time, you know, when you're dealing with issues of racism, um, I've always kind of felt, and this is just my personal opinion, and people are welcome to disagree with me. Send a note to podcast at crossfeednews.com. Um, but I always felt that, you know, if you, you emphasize your race too much, um, you know, that's not going to get rid of racism, you know. Um, and so, you know, this is more focused on the culture itself, but it's, it's pretty hard to separate the two. It's all kind of connected. Um, but you know, as far as a church, I don't. What do you think, Jim? I, I don't. You, you guys planning a Kwanzaa celebration at your church? Well, no. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, you know, churches have always been centers of culture. You know, uh, how many Lutheran churches have German dinners? There was a um, you know when I was in Rockford, Swedish churches all had Lucia festivals. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I mean, you know yeah. uh, a lot of Lutheran churches of Oktoberfest. There was a Norwegian Lutheran church in Rockford that had Ludafisk dinners. I don't know, you know, felt bad for the poor people who went to those, but they they ate those. Uh, you know, so you know, uh, 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 there was a big thing in uh, in Holyoke Mass when the Catholic Church and uh, the Catholic uh, diocese was. Cl- consolidating churches because they were going to mix together a Polish and Hispanic congregation. You know, these two different ethnic cultures and how that was going to blend. Uh, so churches have always been, and a lot of churches have a struggle then coming out of the ethnicity. Uh, you know, for example, you have the, like a German church that, uh, you know, historically German ethnic congregation and everybody kind of moved out in the, in the black neighborhood now. And how do they make that switch? You know, so that's that's always a, been an issue for churches. Um, I think it's a good thing that, that 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 the congregation is saying, "How can we uplift in this black community, black culture?" Okay, and uh, you know, I just you know, my one person says says something about uh, you know. Uh, 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 you know, this, this, the, the Kwanzaa is a very important part of, uh, African American culture. I'm trying to find exactly the quote. It's a major part of our African American uh, heritage that many younger people do not know about. The president of the Connecticut right. double NAACP Youth and College right, Division. Yeah. It says we yeah, can all uh, come together under different terms and understand the importance of learning everybody's culture. Right. Uh, well, you know, it's been around since 1966, so I'm not sure. You know, it's a real big part of the culture, and I'm not sure. You know, I, and that's probably why a lot of younger people don't know anything to worry about it much, is because it really, it's, you know, uh, until recently, it's only been the last few years that I've you know really seen anything about um, you know Kwanzaa. Every year, the the, the uh, comic strip Curtis, right after Christmas, has a special. 
African themed uh, comic strip, you know, during the days of Kwanzaa. Uh, but you know, it's 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 you know, it's not an authentic. It's based on harvest festivals in African countries. But right. if you were to actually talk to somebody from Africa and say, you know, yeah, we're celebrating Kwanzaa, they'd look at you kind of funny. What's that? You know, it's they they, they would not recognize it as anything authentic. Um, and now, uh, you know, saying that to having worked with some African immigrants, uh, they just look at you, you know, never heard of them. Um, but, you know, I, again, but, you know, African American culture is not African culture. It's African American culture. It's black American culture. And to celebrate, set up a, a, a system to celebrate that, I think is a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. And for churches to do that, I think it's a good thing to do. So, uh, you know, this got more, me thinking. You know, why not? Uh, um, I was, because it was just this week that I was reading an article about, uh, maybe it was last week. Anyway, it, it was about, uh, segregated, the, there's, there's an old quote that Sunday morning is the, um, most segregated hour of the week or something like that. How so many churches are, you either have a white church or a black church or, or whatever, and uh, and you just don't see a lot of racial integration um, on 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 Sunday morning, and um, and that kind of got me thinking. Now, um, our church is not completely white, um, but it for the most part, you know, with a with a, one or two exceptions, and. Um, in fact, ironically, uh, we had a much larger percentage of, of non-whites when I was in rural Iowa, <laughs> uh, mostly because of adopted children. Um, but uh, we, you know, I, I want at the same time people of regardless of of what their um, what their background is uh, to know that they're welcome here. You know. Okay. Again, though, I think you're dealing with. Yeah, I've heard that about the segregation. Okay. My last church, we were 25 percent Jamaican. Okay, we were about fourth the people from, you know, off the boat from Jamaica. Okay, a lot of them, and, and people in the neighborhood said, "Yeah, not too many uh, blacks go to that church, but a lot of Jamaicans do." Well, if you ever seen Jamaicans, Jamaicans are black. <laughs> okay, but it's always funny to me. They say, you know, not too many blacks go there, but a lot of Jamaicans do. Okay, they understood this is a different group than mm-hmm. black Americans. Um, there was, and the reason they liked our church is a lot of them were brought up Anglican. And so they were used to liturgical worship. And so this was, you know, fit right in with them. But a lot of the African American folks, they would go. We were just on a church row. There are all these little churches. They were into the black uh, Pentecostal church. Most of them were black Pentecostal. Springfield Church, I, the Church of God, was really big. Was really huge. Uh, and um, there was another Congregationalist church. But the preaching and there's a Baptist church. But the preaching style was different. You know, much louder, uh, much more emotional. I actually had one member of my congregation leave our church and go to a place called Christian Embassy because she just we were just too reserved for her, hmm. you know, uh, um, you know, and and I, I had African Americans, you know, and I because we like we had a funeral for uh, uh, one one member of our church who was very pro very prominent in the black community, and I think I was the only white guy there. I and a couple of the other members. I mean, it was it was. But I mean, the guys, I mean, they talking to them and stuff and they would, they would go, you know, they were like, uh, yeah, that'd been a little bit louder in my church, at our <laughs> church, you know, that would have been, you know, you were awful quiet there, you know, a place was awful quiet. Had another, uh, time, uh, had a black family visiting us for Easter. They were, uh, with, with, with one of their parents and one of them came up to me afterwards and he goes, Oh, I just wanted to yell during your sermon and say amen and and praise God and hallelujah. Oh, was, but I couldn't do that here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, you know, again, are we segregated because we don't want any black people? Or is it just simply our different styles of worship? 
Yeah. So, and you what know, would be considered what would be considered appropriate and normal? Which, you know, raises a lot of on a just a completely separate topic. Um, you know, issues of uh uh, of what is appropriate for um you know for worship and stuff like that and um and and how do you adapt your service for your particular cultural context i mean you know we're not going to be adapting that kind of a model because most of our people that are already members here would be very uncomfortable with that and now for something completely different i'm sorry dave i'm afraid i can't do that then you have to real you have to recognize that there's a need there for something else you know for somebody else to fill in that space right and uh we we actually got that topic tonight and me ahead of my church uh but but really Dale none of this matters because Jesus is coming back next year yep yeah and we have just over a year Wow. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. So there's this guy. What's his name? Uh, Harold Camping. Her- Harold Camping, and he, uh, yeah, out in Oakland, California, and he's uh, an engineer by trade, but I don't think he's a very good one. But he runs this thing called the Family Ministry. He's 88 years old, and he scrutinized the Bible for 70 years to find. Uh, um, to develop when Jesus is coming back. Now, he's, he said this several times, most recently in 1994, uh, in which he had dozens of uh, people there waiting for Jesus to return. But um, he didn't. He said a few years ago he uh, crunched the numbers and discovered that the end of the world is May 21st, 2011. Yep. Now, you all people thought it was 2012 when the Mayan calendar ran out. No, no, no. How can he get there? Jay Leno the other night, did you catch it? Because, you know, the, the, his, his primetime show is not doing well, and they're canceling mm-hmm. it. He said, yes, he says, this isn't doing well. My primetime show will be ending February 12th. The very day the Mayan calendar said it would. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I did catch that one. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> yeah, no, this, I, this guy, uh, this, this kind of, I thought this is funny. It says, um... Camping has followers from the Bay Area to China. And I thought, so do we. So what? <laughs> He's got a few more than we do. <laughs> but you know, as far as I mean, this is a this is a global media, you know, world. So and we've got, you know, there's people that are watching this episode in China. Shout out to you guys, you know. Um Okay. Okay, so here's his theory here. <clears throat> Uh, numbers mean different things in the Bible. Five, he says, equals atonement. Now, I haven't figured that one out yet. I've never heard that one before. Three, ten equals completeness. Now, I have heard that, that ten equals complete. That, that is the number for completeness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 17 means heaven. And I have no idea. I'd never heard that one before either. So, we take these numbers then. Very important. The, the 5, the 10, and the 17. Now, he says, Christ was hung on the cross on April 1st, 33 A.D. Was it more like 29? I don't know. Yeah, well. <laughs> Give or take. <laughs> it might have been, you know, the earliest 27. But now go to April 1, 2011, that's 1,978 years. Then multiply 1,978 by 365.2422 days, the number of days in a solar year. Uh, then go uh, 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 add 51. I don't know why we add 51, but that's for the days between April 1st to May 21st. And May 21st. you get... Uh, what? I'm trying to figure out what's so special about May 21st. I don't know yet, Pinky. I don't know. But if we add, if we multiply 
1978 by 365.2422 and add 51, we have seven, 722,500. And 5 times 10 times 17 squared is 722,500. Or and to put into atonement times completeness times heaven squared is seven thousand two hundred and seven is is seventy two to five hundred. So therefore, uh, uh, um, you know, and that's the way uh, it yeah. works. It's the story from the time Christ made payment for your sins until you're completely saved. So yeah. I tell you, I just fell off my chair when I realized that. Right? How many different hoops did you have to jump through to come up with? It? You know. This isn't something where you, because it's, you're multiplying this number and then you're adding this other and, and like, this is, this isn't the sort of thing that you just land on by accident. You know, it took right. him 70 years to come up with this. Well, I, I see, I'm thinking he kind of goes backwards. You see, I think he may have actually, you know, come, come up with this, the squared number and then, you know, divided that into 365, 2422, and, you know, wound up with 1978, remainder 51, you know, and, and just kind of put it together like, like that. Um, I mean, <clears throat> this is, this is, you know, uh, 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 good way to make money? I guess. Uh, well, yeah, I think he's got these uh, May 11th T-shirts and this other stuff out there, so I guess so. Uh, but what gets me is this one guy uh, uh, named Rick LaCase, and he was there in ni- September 1944 and said, oh, 94. Yeah, uh, ni- 1994, he said, oh, well, he was wrong, but this time it's going to happen. There was some doubt. We didn't have any proof. This time we do. Two words. Therapy. Uh, I... I don't see the proof. I, I see somebody just playing with numbers. <laughs> I, um, I, I like this guy. He says, you know, if, if it's if it's if it's wrong, will that change it? I can't think like that. Everything's just too positive right now. You know, I, I, it sounds like the you know reading the people who followed William Miller in the eighteen hundreds. You're crazy. Yeah, I mean, you know, there have been so many people that have come and gone that have you know nailed down a date and but you know what it comes down to is and they've got even a, a quote here from james krieger of the secrets of the apocalypse revealed um he says jesus himself said in matthew twenty four thirty six, of that day and hour knows no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only right you know no one knows the day or the hour and this guy's nailed down a day you know it's one thing when people pick a year which I think is still completely messed up, but um, but they go well. The Bible says no one knows the day, but I, I've narrowed it down to within a year's span, you know. Like, okay, well, you know that's not what it means, but you know, <laughs> this guy he says, oh no, I know the day, you know. And one thing that I I felt was missing from this is asking, uh, camping, hey. Uh, Bible says no one knows the day. What you know? What are you saying? <laughs> well, now they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They didn't have they didn't have an engineer around to figure all this out for them. If they they did. They would have. Um, you know this stuff. I mean, yeah. You know, of course, we know really that Jesus returned secretly in nineteen nineteen. You know, whatever year it was, Jehovah's Witnesses said he came. So, I don't. I really, he he actually returned in the eighteen hundreds. You know. When uh, William Miller came, you know, then he, you know, that that was the birth of Seventh Day Adventists. So, who knows? Hey, we got a note from our buddy George, uh, which is something that I'd seen last week, uh, that Art Cloakley died. Cloakley died. Uh, now, Art Cloakley was uh, uh, the pioneer of uh, stop uh, stop stop motion animation. That's what it's called. Um, and also called claymation. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably more recently, his most famous thing was the uh, 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 California Raisins. Uh, he, he had developed them. But uh, his first creation, of course, was Gumby. 
And he also then was the creator of that wonderful show, Davy and Goliath. And, uh, which was, well, I'll tell you, I watched that show when I was a kid and stuff, and I was like, I don't know, four or five, you know, five, six years old, I watched it. I'll never forget at the end of it, realizing that it was done by Lutherans. Yeah. And I, I get to sound out the word Lutheran, and I thought, oh, these are Lutherans. We and used to watch it in Sunday school. You know, <laughs> it was a uh, projector. Oh man, yeah, the, the old projectors and stuff, but it was a, yeah, uh, um, yeah, they were, the, it was done by the United Lutheran Church in America, sponsored it and paid for it. And I didn't know the difference between Lutherans. I just thought it was cool that Lutherans had such a neat show, neat card. Well, is that cool that Luther seal that is part of the, yeah, the, the kind of, with the rocket came down and went bloop. And <laughs> yep. And then, and then they started off with a, a mighty fortress. Yep. Uh, the theme song. Um, but we, um, uh, and I knew kids, I've known people, I've met people up here who were, uh, you know, Christian. I met people up here who were Jewish, um, you know, all kinds of people my age, uh, um, and who have said, oh yeah, I used to watch Davy and Goliath every weekend. Oh. You know. Yeah. It's still on, um, once in a while on like, uh what CBN or something like that, or, you know, some of those other Christian stations, they, they still air it because my kids have watched it and they really like it too. So, you know, it, it's, it's timeless. It's beautiful. So yeah, it's a beautiful we, show. And, uh, and claymation is such a, a, a hard thing to do. I mean, animation is hard enough because you, you know, you're drawing, but claymation is even more time intensive because you're actually moving the, the, everything just a little bit there and, yeah. for the clay nation, the stop motion. So very labor intensive work. Um, so we, you know, really just, uh, Cloakey himself was a, a master, uh, you know, kudos to the, uh, LCA, uh, actually the United Lutheran Church in America at the time that uh, began producing it and to picking, uh, such an excellent producer, um, and director and his uh, production studio did just such, such a fantastic job. Yep. So, yeah, it's too bad that, you know, the world is poor and heaven's richer. Yes, that's for sure. And, uh, but, yes, I also used to watch Gumby, and I also, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you ever saw it. A few years ago, there, well, many years ago, actually, now, I guess, almost 20. <laughs> I'm getting old. Uh, but, uh, when the California Raisins were big, they actually had a claymation special, Christmas special. Yep, and yep, I've never seen that. It was just beautifully done. It was just oh, gorgeous stuff there. Yep. So, so um, reminder, or if if you're not aware of it, if you're on Facebook, and uh, boy, isn't everybody. Now, I know some of our users probably aren't, but um, we do have a Facebook page, and it's been kind of, just kind of sitting there doing nothing uh, for, oh, I don't know, a year or so. Um, but uh, now I finally got it rigged up so that uh, when new... Uh, episodes are posted it automatically posts there and the cool thing about it is that um you can it'll just if you go in and click on become a fan uh, of the show then that'll show up right in your news feed too and so good way to um you can hit share and you know and tell other people about the show that way too so i encourage you to pop over there if, if you just go over to crossfeednews.com uh, over on the on the right side you'll see the become a fan on facebook uh, little uh, thing there and the widget and you just click on that and it'll take you right to the page so i want to let you know what that happened I, i've been trying to get that thing to do i've been trying to get it to do that for a while now and uh and it just really had a hard time with it so i finally got it working now so i'm i'm, I'm pretty psyched about that so so we will be seeing you all next week and uh we will uh pray that god would bless you and watch over you always yep good night everybody god bless you.